Okay, today's lecture is going to come from your text for the class, Graphic Design for Everyone, Understanding the Building Blocks so you can do it yourself. And this lecture is going to be on format, hierarchy, and composition. So the basics of choosing a format and understanding the power of white space are fundamental to good design. In design terms, format is the size, shape, and medium in which your design will be produced. Having a good sense of what you want to achieve and who you are targeting will help you choose the right format of your design project. White space doesn't have to be white. The term refers to the room that is deliberately left within blocks of text between design elements or around the margins of a page. Master the use of space and your designs will both look more professional and work better. White space is also referred to as clear space. So we're gonna talk a little bit about space and layouts. And we're going to start with margins. The size of a margin, the space between the design elements and the edge of the layout, is a key factor in how a page works. Narrow margins may make a layout look crowded, while wider margins can convey a sense of organization and allow the viewer to focus on the subject. And it's important to remember that there are exceptions for each use. So down below, we see a magazine layout has wide margins on the left-hand side, has somewhat narrow margins in the center, and then again on the top and the bottom. They all frame the content, and they all start to create organization on the page. So it's also important to remember that space affects pace. The space between elements on the page affects the legibility of your design. It affects the total communication, both pictures and text, you are designing for a small format, like a phone seen below. Keep it simple and use one column. So as we can see in the design below, the designer has paced or is pacing the user through the steps of the checkout process. So keeping the amount of information on a single page minimal so not to confuse the user and also to make the checkout process much easier to understand. Remember, less is more. So white space or clear space can make a powerful statement exuding confidence and authority. It is often associated with luxury. Think of the way some high-end restaurants present food arranged at the center of a huge white plate. So we can see the principle of less is more applied to the Rise and Shine website. You have a beautiful image of the food, the logo of the restaurant, tagline, a good place to eat breakfast, and very simple navigation. So how do we structure a layout? So no matter how simple the design, it needs structure, an ordered and logical way of positioning elements. There are many ways to build a layout, but the aim is the same, to convey the message as meaningfully and attractively as possible. So we're gonna start with the modular grid. A modular layout can be as simple or as complex as you need. The risk is that everything can look square and monotonous, varying the scale, leaving white space, and using cutout images will all help change the pace. So hierarchy. The graphic designer's role is to take a jumble of information and organize it so it's easy to understand. Hierarchy, showing the relative importance of different elements, plays a key role in achieving that goal. By smart handling of typography and color, and by manip manipulating the size and scale of different elements, you can create order. So oftentimes what I used to do as a designer, I would get these Word documents from my clients. And I would go through the Word document, and even if they had their headers bolded and their text in paragraph format, and their charts in a certain way, I'd still read through the content and note just pen on paper what I felt was most important. And then I'd also, by reading the content, if I wanted to do something like a pull quote, just pulling some information out of the article and making it a little bit bigger using scale and color to break up the layout a little bit, making that a little bit bigger, I could pull out information that I thought would work as a pull quote. Now the client would always come back or could always come back and change that information. But without going back through that type first and reading it and, and 
noting the hierarchy or noting the hierarchy that I saw, my design would never have the pull quote. And if my design never had the pull quote, then the client would never know that a pull quote was an option or it does another design element was an option. So it's really important to go through and read that content and determine what's important. You can even determine what text is important that you want to bring in an image for, what text that you could represent with an image. Because that just plays up the meaning of the content. The ways to achieve hierarchy with type. We have one, size. We can make things big, right? Two, we can put things in uppercase. Now, the, the key thing to remember with uppercase is uppercase can be a lot smaller and have the same amount of impact as upper lower. We can change the weight, right? So we can make something bold or black, or at the same time, we can make it light. Those give it different emphasis on the page. Um, <clears throat> a light typeface at a large size can have as much emphasis as a heavier weight at a smaller size. We can also play with the position on the page. So where does that headline hit? Where does the most important element hit on the page? And that breaks up, not only breaks up the layout, makes it a little bit more interesting, but it also provides hierarchy to the page. You can use color. So we can bring in, we've been working in black and white all this time. We can now get to bring in pops of color. And pops of color can create different types of hierarchy. So a bright orange or a bright yellow can bring attention, but soft pastels may actually push content back. Then we can use contrast. And this can be contrast with type, like is displayed in number six on the right. Or it can be contrast of clear space and type. So you can have a lot of clear space, very little type, which brings emphasis down to that information. So you can create contrast in multiple different ways. So you can use, as we discussed, you can use color to create order. And color is just another tool a designer can use to organize information, highlighting important elements and guiding the eye through more complex layouts. Your job as the designer to show the user or show your audience what to read first, what to read second, and what to read third. And you can do that through hierarchy, through layout techniques, and then through color. Let's look at some examples. So we can use blocks of colors. So setting sections of text in a colored background is an effective way to separate and organize information. This can also be used to flag the same kind of text across several pages. Make sure type is legible against your chosen color. So in the poster to the left, we can see that they've, the designer has used color, scale, to create an interesting layout. But because of color, our eye is pretty much drawn to the yellow first. So we see Futura running across the top, the diamond logo bringing us down to the larger upper lowercase Futura. So we come down and then we read the date. And right underneath the date is save the date and then we move up to the other information. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but follow the color. And the color takes us down the left-hand side to the date and then back up. We can use repetition. So repeating a graphic element in the same color helps draw the viewer's eye throughout a layout and is a useful way to organize long text into more manageable sections. Now we're not exactly looking at that explanation in this example, but this example shows repetition in not only the design, but the color and the color being used. So we're getting hit multiple times with the same message. So contrast. The eye is naturally drawn to the brightest colors, so use them to pick out the most important visual information. This is especially effective when the rest of the color palette is understated. We talked about that pull quote earlier, right? So if we, if we have text in black and then we take our pull quote, small section of text, and put it in, say, in this bright orange that's over here on the left-hand side, then all of a sudden that quote, that information, grabs the eye. And because our text is black, and it's actually, and if you look at this slide, you notice that the black in the right-hand side poster is a full black. 
the text is actually grayed down. Black text on a white page is really tiring for the eye to read. So a little trick designers use is we just take the, the tent and move it down to 80%. So it becomes a gray. But when we have that gray text and that bright orange, where does our, our eye go? It goes directly to that orange. So as you can see in these three posters, the design for the Atlantic Theater Company, the designer has chosen to use contrast in three different ways. And each different way works equally as well. The poster on the left uses the background color to be the brightest color, and then the cloud nine to contrast from that. So the white shape actually brings our eye back to the center and reads cloud nine once we are, our attention has been brought to that poster by the orange. The middle poster takes a different approach. Still, the shape is in the, in the background. Again, focusing our eye to the center, but the band's visit is now in orange. And it has a little bit of that knockout where the two T's are in white, and the background's a little bit more mild in the blue. And then the far right poster, again, just another example. You got that central shape and skeleton crew in the orange, with a little bit of that reverse out with the S and the W, and that high contrast back, black background. So posters, pull quotes, lots of text, little text. It all works the same. We can use scale to create order. So the bigger, the bigger something is, the more attention it gets. But size is also relative. Something can appear big or small depending on its surroundings and relationship to other elements. Skillful handling of size and scale is key to creating order and balance in your layouts. Size. In graphic terms, size is a fixed value. For instance, a paragraph of text can be set at a size of 12 point. Designers select the appropriate point size to make sure that text will be readable. Scale also describes something's size, but in terms of its relationship to elements around it. An audience will usually look at the biggest or sometimes the smallest element first. So getting scale right is crucial to effectively conveying the key part of your message. Probably one of my favorite examples of the use of scale is with the Ant-Man advertising campaign and we were looking at the the movie poster here where ant-man is this tiny tiny character using the audience's knowledge of the marvel universe well let's put him on thor's hammer we know thor is a god he is larger than life and his hammer is even bigger so we are using scale to bring our attention to the little man standing on the on the hammer Another movie that did a great job with scale is Godzilla, or the latest rele release of Godzilla. And this is a fantastic poster. I love this poster too. So we have really small elements at the top that draw, us, draw our eye down to the monster. And then we have the city skyline, which is burning, that brings us down to the term, or the movie title, Godzilla. And then the Japanese in the background brings us down, our eye down, to the date, May 16th which sits in white. Fantastic poster. Absolutely amazing design and so impactful. So let's move into composition. To create successful layouts, you'll need to know about composition. And this is putting all the elements together. Using a grid, the structure that underpins a layout, will give you confidence as you no longer face daunting blank space when you start a design while learning to balance the different weights of elements enables you to create harmony and order. A blank page for a designer is probably the scariest thing, and I think it's the scariest thing for any artist. And I'm always envious of the artist or designer who looks at a blank, blank page and go, oh, this is great. And I think they're few and far between. As designers, we can use grids to help give us some underlying structure before we even start putting in all the elements. How are we going to organize all this stuff? Well, 
we learn how to use grids. So in design, a grid is a structure that sits invisibly underneath your layout and helps you arrange elements in an organized way. When you design, use grids to help maximize the meaning and visual appeal of layouts. We have three basic types of grids. The one you see on the screen now is a single column grid. You're going to see this in most novels or books. Next, we have multiple columns. And this is usually found in a magazine would be the most appropriate place you may find this. And this is a basic three column grid on a single page. Next, when we talked about the modular grid a little bit more, the modular grid gives us multiple touch points. And this is a basic five by six modular grid. And it gives us all these little squares. And as it was discussed earlier, the modular grid has a tendency to create blocky designs, but there are ways in which we can use the modular grid and all those touch points to really break up our page and in the combination of using hierarchy and scale and color and all those things to create a really interesting layout. And as I mentioned before, we usually start with learning how to create a modular grid because it is one of, in my opinion, one of the easier grids to learn how to use. And then we can move into that column grid. So the steps to setting up a grid. First, you want to decide on a format. Think about your content. So what is the message that you're trying to deliver to your audience? What is going to be on this design? Is it, if it's a poster, what information is going to go on the, on the poster? If it's in a magazine, what information have you been provided by your client or by a third party? What content have you written? You need to do your research. Research is an extremely important part of design and often overlooked. So you want to look for inspiration, visual inspiration. See what other people are doing. You want to, if you need to, research more about your content. For example, I did a lot of work for NIGMS and the NIH. Uh, a lot of medical stuff that I really didn't know a lot about. So I'd read the content and be lost, but do a little bit more research about the content. Just enough so I got a good understanding about what the client was presenting to their audience. And I understood that more. I would look at images to see what type of images relate it to the content. Maybe it's a specific word that comes out, a big medical word that comes out of the content. Type that in. What type of imagery comes up? You know, what type of cellular biology are they talking about this month? So do your research. Conduct your research. Get to know your audience. Get to know your content. Next, you're going to set the margins. Don't ever rely on the default margins. The half inch margins that, that InDesign defaults you at. Nothing default in InDesign, which we'll discuss later in another video, is ever good. So we want to actually have a conscious decision about what our margins are going to be. Next, we're going to set the columns or blocks. So this is, again, what type of grid am I going to use? Am I going to use a modular grid? What's going, what is it going to be? Is it going to be a 5x6, 5x7, 3x7? Are we going to use columns? How many columns are we going to have on a single page? And once that decision is made, we're going to go ahead and we're going to set those columns up. We're going to set that grid up. And last, the book notes to set a baseline grid. And I'm going to advise you not to set a baseline grid. Now, one thing I always advise my students to do is in a job situation, you want to check with your client or you want to check with your art director to see whether or not the firm that you are working with or the company that you are working for wants the baseline grid set. What the baseline grid does is if you ever look at a publication and the left column and the right column, the baseline of the text aligns all the way down, even if there's a return. The baselines always align. And type, learning to typeset in this manner is a step above beginner in my mind. It complicates a lot of things. There's a lot of math involved. Everything has to be divisible by 
your baseline grid, so the size of your type, all your space afters. You have to work also, it's better to work in a, in a measurement format called points and picas. Uh, it may be something that you need to learn down, down the road, uh, but let's I'll let you learn it down the road. Makes things, like I said, in my mind, much too difficult for a designer who is just learning how to use grids and InDesign and all the stuff that I'm going to be throwing at you over the next week or so. Let's look at the anatomy of a grid. So what we're seeing here is the spread view. So a spread is two pages side by side. It's also known as reader view. So if we open up a magazine, those two pages sitting right next to each other, that is a spread. That is how we read the magazine, as indicated by that eel down at the bottom. You also have, like I said, one page, which is one side of the spread. That dotted line down the center is the spread gutter. So if you think about that's where your staples go, that's where your glue's gonna go. It's also the part of the, the spread that the pages dip down into. So if you're like looking at a really thick book, you know you have to crack the spine sometimes to be able to read the content down in the spine. That's actually poor design because they really should have made those margins wider on the inside. So you didn't have to crack the, the spine. So you didn't have to lay the book flat. You should be able to hold the book naturally open and be able to read all the content. That's good design. Up top, we have the top margin. Down at the bottom, we have a bottom margin. On the left of a spread, you have outside margins. And that may seem a little weird that, you know, I'm stressing the fact that it's they're called outside margins when they're on the outside of the page. But when we switch to a single page layout, say you're designing a poster like you will be in InDesign, those margins become left and right margins. So they're only outside margins when you're in a spread view. When you go to single page view, they are left and right margin. Okay, so the orange lines is that baseline grid. Next, we have the green lines, which indicate our columns. And you can see that the, the grid has two columns per page, but the space in between the two columns is called a column gutter. So if we were setting our text in two columns, so text that starts in the left-hand column and goes into the right-hand column, we would have this space in between the gutter. And there are certain ways in InDesign to set this up. And it's important to remember though that even if we have two columns of text, we can still bring a pull quote, we can still, still take our headline or anything like that and cross over those two columns. All right, a couple other things. Down at the bottom, you'll see a magenta L kind of line on its side. That's a marker. That's where your page number or what's called a folio may go. An important thing to remember about the folio or the marker is that it should be designed. If you want to see something really cool, go to Google Image Search and search for uh, folios or uh, page number designs. And you'll get to see how designers have really taken that small element on the page and turned it into this small piece of design that's absolutely beautiful. You can do some fabulous things with a folio. Now, just because the marker on this anatomy of the grid is located in the lower right and lower left hand corners does not mean that is where it must live. I've seen them on the inside of the page. I've seen them on the, in the outside margin. I've seen them up on the top of the page. I've seen them in the inside middle. So just like everything else, you can play around with the position, scale, and the design. The one thing I want to stress, and the reason I want you to go Google folio designs or page number designs, is because nothing that goes on this, this spread when you're designing should be overlooked or treat it as just some afterthought. Everything needs to be designed. Okay, so one last thing I want to point out are our trim marks and our bleed. So our trim marks indicate the edge of our actual page. The bleed is anything that goes off the edge of the page needs to come out to that one eighth inch bleed. And this is just a, a fundamental production rule that you have to learn and you have to accept and you have to ingrain into your brain that you just do it every time. Every time you set up a document, you set it up with a bleed. Every time something goes off the page, you pull it out to the bleed. The sooner you can follow that rule, the better the production and the easier the production of your work is going to, going to be. So 
I could go on and on about the anatomy of grid. I don't know if you've been able to tell throughout this presentation. I am, I'm stoked about getting into layout, layout design with you guys. Uh, it's a very exciting part. It's a, it's a transition from learning about basic rules of type into actually designing. And it gets really exciting from this point forward. And this is just the start and the basic things that we need to learn first before we move in and we do packaging design and we do corporate identities and we do, we do all sorts of stuff later on in the curriculum. It all starts right here. It all starts with understanding composition, hierarchy, and format. So humans are hardwired to respond to visual order. If we look at a collection of letters or shapes, we will always try to make visual sense of the jumble. Alignment is a useful tool for delivering information in the ordered, organized way that viewers respond to it best. And although this book references right aligned and justified text, we will not be using those forms of alignment in any design course. This is because one of the goals of this program is to make you proficient in setting type, and that cannot be learned using two text alignments mentioned above. And that's the end of this part of the lecture. I know I got excited. I went off on a little bit of tangents. I hope this gets you, gets your, your blood pumping, gets you excited about not only this next project, but also the projects that are to come in this class and in the rest of the graphic design curriculum. I'm excited. I'm excited to teach you. I'm excited to see what you produce. And uh, let's just keep going and dive right in. Until the next video and then until the next lecture have fun guys